The title of my talk is, uh, when does approval voting make the right choices? Uh, right choices in quotation marks, and this is joint work with Mark Kilgore at Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada. Uh, for those of you who don't know about approval voting, it's a voting system in which voters can vote for as many alternatives as they like. Each uh, alternative voted for gets one vote, there's no ranking, and the alternative or alternatives with the most votes wins. Uh, it was proposed by several people independently in the 1970s, but it actually goes back to uh, the 13th century. Uh, it was used um, in Dogi arrest elections in Venice, uh, and about the same time, um, Popes were elected by approval voting. The Cardinals could vote for as many uh, candidates as they like. And as far as we know, there's quite a bit of secrecy associated with voting for Popes. Uh, it's still used today. Um, and it's used in a number of uh, private associations, uh, two major math societies, the Mathematical Association of America and the American um, uh, Mathematical Society uh, is used by the American Statistical Association, about a dozen societies in all, but it's not used in any public elections that we know of. Um, it's been controversial, um, <clears throat> and uh, it's often uh, contested by people who prefer ranking systems like the board account or the hair system of single transferable vote, but I'm not going to argue about the merits or demerits of approval voting today. I want to connect it to uh, indirectly the Condorcet jury theorem, which does ask about uh, right choices. So here's an overview. Uh, the assumptions are that a voter's approval of a proposal, it could be a bill, it could be a proposition, it could be a candidate, uh, it could be a criminal charge in a trial, depends on the proposal's probability of being right, or you could use another adjective, good or just, and also the voter's probability of making a correct decision about its rightness or wrongness. Uh, so two probabilities. Um, the probability is assumed to be independent, and the conclusion of the study is that if the average probability that voters are correct in their judgment is greater than one half, not the probability that each voter has a uh, probability greater than one half of uh, making a correct judgment, but the average probability of all voters uh, being greater than one half, then the proposal with the greatest probability of being right will, in expectation, receive the greatest number of approval votes. And this also holds when voters' probabilities of being correct are state-dependent but not proposal-dependent. I'll define those terms later. And uh, if voters follow a leader uh, with an above-average probability of correctly judging proposals. Uh, we also find that sometimes voters will more frequently select the <coughs> right proposal by not following a leader, even if the leader has greater than average probability of being correct. Uh, and this has tie-ins to the Condorcet jury theorem, which I'll say something about. And then I'll also talk about applications to different kinds of voting situations. So judging multiple proposals. Let PI be the probability that <coughs> proposal I is right, and I assume uh, there are M proposals. And let QJ be the probability that voter J judges a proposal cor correctly. Um, now, a proposal's <coughs> being right and a voter's judgment of its being correct are assumed to be independent events, so PI and QJ are unconditional probabilities, but I'll qualify that assumption later. Assume that a voter approves of all approvals, of all proposals that he judges to be right and none that he judges to be wrong, receiving some kind of signal, presumably. Then there are two ways that, the voter, that voter J can decide to vote <coughs> for proposal I. Either proposal I is right and voter J judges it correctly, so approves of it, and that has uh, joint probability PI times QJ. Or proposal I is wrong and voter J judges it incorrectly, so he thinks it's right, 
And that has a uh, probability, which are the complements of pi and qj. Let capital ABI be the expected number of approval votes for proposal I. And let little ABI, AB for approval, be the average per voter of this expected number. Then our first result is, for two proposals, I1 and I2, the statement that <coughs> And the average for I1 is greater than the average for I2. I1 gets more votes. If and only if the probability uh, that I1 is correct is greater than the probability that I2 is correct. Um, that statement is true if and only if capital Q is greater than one half, and capital Q is the average of the QJ. So if the average of <coughs> making a correct judgment uh, is greater than one half, so some people could be below average, some people could be above average, but if the average is greater than one half, uh, then this um, conditional statement, this if and only if statement holds that I1 will get more votes than I2 if and only if its probability of being correct is greater than the probability of I2 being correct. So that's the sort of first result, and now I'm going to uh, qualify that and introduce non-independence and so on. As an illustration of this theorem, assume that jurors in a criminal trial vote on multiple proposals, say charges against the defendant, uh, possible sentences. Effectively, they are using approval voting to provide a measure of support for each proposal. The one that receives the greatest approval is the one most likely to be right. Now, there are two scenarios that are quite different. Let's say we're talking about charges in a trial. The defendant is charged with reckless driving, drug possession, and assault, with the probability of correction, conviction or acquittal on each of the three charges. These are the proposals. In this scenario, there are eight plausible vote combinations. Uh, the charges are independent, so that's two times two times two. Now consider the scenario of sentences. There's a simple char single charge of murder, and the jury has three choices. Conviction for murder, conviction for manslaughter, or acquittal. Again, there are three choices, but not eight possible vote combinations, because in charges, voting is akin to binary voting on propositions. Uh, and a juror will approve of the one <coughs> option, guilt to innocence, on each of the charges. <coughs> He believes to be correct in each. Because there are only two options, plurality voting, I'll call it PV, would give the same result. So approval voting doesn't add anything when we're talking about charges, uh, which are independent and allow for eight different combinations. But let's go to sentences. In sentences, a voter may approve of more than one sentence, for example, murder and manslaughter, but presumably not murder and acquittal the one that receives the most approval will be implemented. Because there are more than two options, there may be strategic voting. For example, if a juror believes that his preferred charge, murder, will not get the most votes, but manslaughter may, he may well approve of both murder and manslaughter to ensure some conviction. Under plurality voting, this juror would have to make a switch from murder, murder to manslaughter because murder is not going to stand up, he thinks. And no longer <coughs> would our subsequent theorems hold. Thus, PV may not yield the proposal most likely to be right. So approval voting, we're arguing, is the way to go uh, in the scenario of sentences, but it doesn't matter in the scenario of charges. Okay, now let's uh, look at different kinds of dependence. The first is state dependence. Assume that the probability that voter J is correct about a proposal is not a constant QJ, which I assumed before, but depends on whether the proposal is right or wrong. If the proposal is right, then voter J will judge it correctly with probability Q sub I, maybe you can't read that, that's for right, of J. If the proposal is wrong, then voter J will judge it correctly with probability QWJ. So 
QJ depends on whether the proposal is right or wrong. That's what we call state dependence. But capital QR and capital QW be the average probabilities that a voter makes the correct judgment about respectively right and wrong proposals, state dependent. So we're averaging over all voters. And our next result is, for two proposals, I1 and I2, the statement that I1 gets more votes than I2 if and only if probability that I1 is uh, correct, is greater than the probability that I2 is correct, is true if and only if QR, Q being right, average probability being right, plus QW, average probability being wrong, the sum is greater than one. And you'll notice that this is a generalization of theorem one. <coughs> it is equivalent in the special case that QR is equal to QW is equal to Q. There's no state dependence. Where we require for theorem one that Q be greater than one half. Well, now if we break things down into two different states, we don't have the average probability being greater than one half. We have the sum of the probabilities to the two different states being greater than one. So this is a more general result if there are two or more states. Okay, so now I talk about state dependence states being right or wrong in this particular case. Now I want to talk about proposal dependence. Assume that voter J's ability to judge a proposal may be different for every proposal, even those in the same state of rightness or wrongness, so things don't just depend on the state. Consequently, the probability that voter J's judgment is correct about proposal I is QIJ. It's a function of both I and J. So now we're linking these two probabilities, which we assume were independent or just state dependent. So our result is, if voters' probabilities of correct judgment are proposal dependent, then even if Q, the average probability of being right, is greater than one half, theorem one, for all voters, for all values of I, it is possible for two proposals, I1 and I2, to satisfy I1 gets on the average more votes than I2, but I'm, the probability that I1 is correct. Uh, you said that on the zero. Yeah, sorry. The, probability, the average is less than the average for I2. The probability that I1 may be greater uh, can hold. So uh, theorem one or theorem two results uh, are no longer holding this kind of proposal dependence in general, but there are special cases. Assume that all proposals satisfy Q equals P, the average probability equals uh, the probability of being correct, uh, being judged correctly, sorry, by voters. Assume that P is greater than one half and less than or equal to one. The, then the greater the probability, P, I, P, that a pro proposal is correct, the greater the probability that it is judged correctly by all voters. Assume that kind of dependence. And this example can be generalized. Suppose that for all proposals, P and Q, Q, the average probability that voters are correct, is constant or increasing in P. So now they're related, but one, but in a special kind of relationship. Then for any two proposals, I1 and I2, Approval voting chooses I1 over I2 in expectation, provided that the probability of that I1, the probability that one is correct is greater than the probability that two is correct. Back to theorem one. The conditions of theorem four are satisfied when Q function of P equals Q is constant. That's theorem one. And when Q function of P is P itself, this previous example. The most realistic examples are those in which Q of P is monotonically increasing in P. So Q of P may increase slowly near P equals one half, but then rapidly as P approaches one. If that's the case, then the theorem one still applies. Uh, you get this relationship between the probability of being correct and getting more approval votes. Follow the data. Can voters improve the chance <coughs> the proposal most likely to be right 
is selected if they all follow the advice of some leader. We'll call it that leader, capital L. One I might expect that follow the leader would be an especially good strategy for, that's, for selecting the proposal most likely to be right when the probability of the leader's judgment is greater than the average probability of everybody. While L, again, has an average, above average probability of judging proposals correctly. Denote by ABL, for leader of I, the average number of approval votes received by proposal I when all voters follow the leader with an above average probability. Then, if that probability is greater than one half, then for two proposals, I1 and I2, we get a usual relationship. If I1 gets more approval and expectation than I2, then its probability of being correct is greater than that of I2. Moreover, we are now looking at the uh, distance between I1 and I2. And the distance, um, sorry, between uh, the average for L and the average for any I1 and 2, then that distance will be greater if and only if uh, Q of L is greater than Q. So if the leader has a better, about the average probability of being correct, then it is more likely that there'll be, everybody following the leader, um, more certainty about, uh, not more certainty, but uh, the average for the leader, the difference between the average for the leader and the two proposals will be greater than the difference between the average for the ordinary voter. So, if L is above average in his ability to judge proposals correctly, it is rational for voters to follow his or her advice rather than relying on their own independent judgments. Thereby, voters increase the chances that approval voting will distinguish the proposals most likely to be right, as measured by widening the difference between the approval votes <clears throat> of better and worse uh, proposals. So that all sounds reasonable, that uh, if you follow the leader, the more likely uh, it's going to be a decisive vote in favor of the proposal with a higher probability of being right. But there's actually a complication. While follow the leader provides a bigger spread between the proposals, again natural because the leader is more likely to be correct in his judgment, it is not true that follow the leader more surely chooses a proposal with a greater probability of being right. The proposal that is most likely to be right can be chosen less frequently under follow the leader than under independent judgments. Now how can that happen? The leader is more likely to make a correct judgment, shouldn't everybody follow him, and more likely you'll get a correct decision. Well, here's the problem. In comparing two proposals, follow the leader makes an error, judging a right proposal to be incorrect, judging a wrong proposal to be correct, whenever the leader does. Everybody's following the leader. But as the number of voters increases, this probability does not change on the follow of the leader. They're following one person. Whereas under independent judgments, the error rate declines as the number of voters increases. This is a Condorcet jury theorem. Consequently, independent judgments may have a lower probability than follow of the leader, a lower error probability than follow of the leader, <coughs> despite the, leader, the latter's bigger spread illustrating the possible divergence between the probability that the proposal is right and its expected approval votes. And that question has been studied much in the uh, betting literature. Um, and it's something called the Kelly betting system uh, that says exactly how much of your uh, cash you should bet on any round to increase the growth as great as possible. As with the Condorcet jury theorem, having a larger number of voters tends to increase the probability of producing the right choice. So you get this result that everybody making independent judgments uh, pushes that probability to one. Whereas if you follow the leader, even with a greater than average probability being correct, 
When he's wrong, everybody else is going to make that wrong judgment, and that's not good. And you're not going to get that probability approaching one unless the leader's probability approaches one. So there's a value in those independent judgments, even though the spread may increase if you follow a better and better leader. So application of politics. Um, <coughs> An argument against following uh, the lead of L, the leader, is made by opponents of groupthink, who claim that independent thinking is suppressed in favor of achieving the group consensus, which often leads to more decisions. On the other hand, if the average voter is genuinely persuaded by L, the leader, and the leader's probability of being correct is greater than average, Independent thinking will not be suppressed, but instead be replaced by the superior thinking of L, based on the more persuasive arguments, presumably, that L offers compared with those offered by other voters. And we use it as an example uh, the deliberations of XCOM, the executive committee which formed uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962. Um, and the story there is that um, the committee was initially leaning to uh, an airstrike against the uh, missiles, which had been emplaced in Cuba. Um, but then there were arguments to the contrary, led particularly by Bobby Kennedy, John Kennedy's brother, and also the Attorney General, who uh, said something to the effect that if we conducted a first strike, it would be a Pearl Harbor in reverse, blackening the name of the United States in the annals of history. So he opposed the first strike. Uh, and he eventually got other members of XCOM, including the Secretary of Defense, uh, McNamara, to go along. So in the end, XCOM recommended not an airstrike against the uh, <coughs> missiles, uh, but a blockade, which was euphemistically called a quarantine at the time. And that's what was used, and that was effective after 13 days in inducing the Soviet Union to withdraw the missiles voluntarily. Now, supposedly there was a quid quo pro whereby the United States would withdraw missiles from Turkey uh, that threatened the Soviet Union. Uh, that was not an agreement, uh, but the missiles were withdrawn uh, a few months later. Uh, so I think that's an example where a leader, perhaps Bobby Kennedy at the time, can influence um, favorably a decision. I say favorably because the Cuban Missile Crisis abated and we didn't have a war with the Soviet Union, much less a nuclear war. And I actually have a personal experience in this regard because the first jury I served on in New York uh, after I came uh, was a jury in which uh, there was a charge of attempted murder by the defendant. And uh, because uh, the circumstances were unclear as to how the sh alleged shot was fired and whether it was attempted murder, uh, the defense requested that uh, the jury visit the scene of the crime. So. Uh, 12 of us, actually 14 if you include the um, substitute jurors, visited the scene of the crime, which was in East Greenwich Village. This was in 1969, um, when things were boiling in a hot summer, and suddenly uh, 14 middle class jurors descend on this rough neighborhood in East Greenwich Village, uh, upsetting the neighbors greatly. So a kind of crowd gathered around as we were going through the um, reenactment of the crime. And uh, we had five armed court officers to protect us, uh, but that was judged not enough, so suddenly we heard siren screaming and the police came in to protect us further. But anyway, we, um, we made judgments about uh, the case and went back to deliberations and took a mock vote and the mock vote was uh, 10 still to um, find the defendant guilty, uh, 2 to acquit. And I was one of those who uh, voted to acquit. And the other person happened to be a physicist. And we argued in the end that um, 
the defendant could not have um, fired the alleged shot at the policeman because he would literally have had to fire around the corner. So we made arguments to this effect. And if you want to consider us leaders, we did persuade the other 10 jurors to change their decisions. And we think, in the end, the right decision was made and we acquitted the defendant. So that's my personal experience with uh, so-called leaders in a situation like that. So I think they may be important, but uh, as the number of voters increases, uh, we have to remember that if the leader makes a mistake, it carries through entirely, whereas when independent jurors or voters are making choices, and their probabilities of making, on average, uh, the correct judgment are not as high, they may be superior. That's the point of this example. And we have a, a numerical example in the paper to illustrate this. Besides juries that consider different sentences or committees like EXCOM that deliberate over multiple strategies, approval voting seems applicable to elections with multiple candidates. In this context, appealing might be a better word to use than right, because there is usually no <coughs> unequivocally right or wrong candidate. Some of his positions might be viewed as right, some wrong, so the voter has to make a, <coughs> make a balance in making a choice, strike a balance in making a choice, so in summary, voters seem well advised to make their own best judgments about proposals, either according to QJ, their own judgments, for each uh, juror of voter J, or by following a leader, whose judgment they respect based on his QL. So if the leader persuades them, I think that's a good reason for following the leader. If the leader is a demagogue, um, and they follow him blindly, that's not a good choice, because when he's wrong, he carries everybody with him. Uh -huh. Okay, so let me summarize. Um, the most approved proposals on approval voting will <clears throat> be those with the greatest probability of being right, if and only if the average probability that the judgment of voters is correct exceeds one half. So again, I emphasize that's the big difference from the Condorcet jury theorem, which assumes that every voter has the same probability and that probability for every voter is greater than one half. Here we only need the average probability to be greater than one half. Theorem one is not state dependent. It holds even if the probability of being right depends on the rightness or wrongness of proposals. But theorem one is proposal dependent. It does not hold if the probability of being right depends on individual proposals. Theorem 1, however, holds for certain kinds of functional dependence. If, for example, the average probability of voters being right is monotonically increasing in P. Follow the data gives a greater <coughs> approval voting spread than independent judgments, but the latter may give a greater probability of being right than follow the data. So that's the subtlety, I think, in the argument, that sometimes you want to follow the leader, especially if he's persuasive, uh, sometimes you may not, especially if there are a large number of voters, and then the Condorcet jury theorem helps move that probability of being correct, making a correct judgment to one. <coughs>